The first lesson is found in the book of Deuteronomy, beginning in chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is found in the book of Judges, chapter 8, beginning with verse number 22. The Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that each of you would give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The weight of the gold rings he asked for came to 1,700 shekels. Not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains that were on their camels' necks. Gideon made the gold into an ephod, which he placed in Ophrah, his town. All Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. The word of the Lord. The psalm is found in 105, beginning with verse 1. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell all of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> so the gospel reading today is really long, so if you need to sit down, don't feel bad, okay? <laughs> so... The gospel reading is found in the book of John, chapter 6, beginning with verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, 
but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. All right, please be seated. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the bread from heaven. God, Father, thank you for sending your Son. Thank you, God, for your, your Holy Spirit that, that truly fills us. And God, thank you for the promises that you make because you want us to have a uh, complete joy and abundant life. You, you, your will for us is good. So thank you for that. And uh, Lord, help us to hear you today in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're, if you're doing the 40 days of prayer journal, which I, I love, it's been really good, I've enjoyed it all week, we actually start uh, today as I am the light of the world. This last week was I am the bread of life, and you'll notice that they're gonna, there's seven uh, I am statements in, in the 40 days that we'll be talking about that Jesus says about himself. I am this, I am that. So I, this, this week what we're talking about is I am the bread of life, and in each of these seven I am statements, God makes, a, makes covenant promises to us. He, he makes a covenant promise. So a covenant is a never-ending, unbreakable relationship. So the type of relationship, or to the type of promise that Jesus is making through these I am statements is these are relationship promises. So now I gotta ask you, so is God love? Yes. Is God good? Like all the time, right? Okay, all the time. God is good, right? And is God perfect? Yes, okay. So if God is love, God is, is good, and God is perfect, then the ifs and thens of all of his promises are loving, good, and perfect, okay? So in other words, uh, all of these, these promises are conditional in the sense that there are instructions involved with them. If you do this, then this will happen, okay? And we need to pay attention to that. Because we want, to be, be, we want to participate in life with God and with one another. That's why he gives the promises. They're relationship promises. And he wants us to do relationship with him and with each other in fullness forever. And so each covenant promise comes with these instructions, like the psalm. The reason we did Psalm 105 verses 1 to 3 twice today, that was our call to worship and also we, we read it, is because it says... Praise the Lord. Here's how you do it. All right? I wanted you to see that there's ways to do things that gives glory to God, that he enjoys. This is how he wants us to do things. And so th with these covenant promises, there's an, there are these if-then things that happen. So the first I am statement that we've covered already in the journals is I am the bread of life. So John 6, uh, beginning with verse 35, and, and I'll... I, I'll get to that. John 6, 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So do you see the condition of that? I'm the bread of life. If you come to me, if you believe in me, then you will never hunger, you'll never thirst. Okay, we need to pay attention to the conditions, because what God wants is for us to have, and Jesus said this in John chapter 15, I, I want you to have abundant life and complete joy. Here's how you do it, okay? So I'm the bread of life. He, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. What does I am the bread of life mean, okay? Well, what does bread do? 
fattens you up, right? It fills you, fills you up. And if you eat too much of it, then it fattens you up. It fills you up, that's right. And, and so uh, when we're talking about the bread of life, what does, what, what is, hung, is hunger an emptiness? Is thirst a type of emptiness? All right, then the bread of life, the promise is, I'm going to fill all of the void. I'm going to fill the emptinesses in your life. Every emptiness, I'm going to fill it. I'm the bread of life. So this is spiritual, physical, emotional, relational. Jesus fills everything. He's our all in all. He's everything we need. Paul put it this way. Uh, so Jesus, yeah, the bread of life is promising to be our completeness in all things. He's the bread that fills every emptiness. Ephesians 3.20, Paul puts it this way. This is a bread of life statement. I love this. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Now to him, who's him? Jesus, all right? Now to Jesus, who is able? Who's able? Jesus. Don't forget that. All right? Because you're going to come up against stuff in life and you'll, you'll think, are you able? And this is the answer. Yes, he's able. Okay? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Some translations I like to say, or even imagine. Right? So to him who is uh, able to do ex- not just a little bit, not just the step, not just enough, but to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can even think, you can ask or even imagine, according to, the, and this is very power, uh, important, the power that works in us. Where's the power? It's who gives it? Who is it? It's, it's Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And where is it? In us. That's very important. The, 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 the one that fills all things, that is all in all, that, that is exceedingly abundant, is in us. That, his power through the Holy Spirit, his, who he is, is in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generation forever and ever. Amen. Right? So how do we get filled with the bread of life Can you get filled with the bread if it sits on the table? What do you have to do? You got to eat it, right? You got to take it in. Take it in. We have to, it it has to be in us. We need to willingly take him in. And so I want to look at this this part of the gospel that that we read. Now, John chapter 6 is one running narrative of four parts. It's a four-part story. We're really only talking about two of the four parts, and I'm, I'm going to add the, the, the finale uh, at later. But the first part of, of John 6 is Jesus feeds the multitudes. He breaks the loaves and fishes. He gives thanks to God and breaks the loaves and fishes, and he feeds people with physical food. And so they're chasing him around. You got that from the story, right? They're chasing him around. But why? Because they want more bread. They want more stuff. They want more miracles, right? They, they're, they're after him for that. But the dis- second part of the story is the disciples on the boat. And so the disciples, it starts in verse uh, 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Very important. Could have said lake, but didn't say lake. It said sea. I'll tell you why. Got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them, right? So they're in, the disciples, who's, who's not with them? Jesus. So you got a boat with a vacancy, right? And who's the vacancy for? That's, that's his spot in the boat, but he's not there, right? You with me? Okay, the void is there, but Jesus is the one that's supposed to fill the void. Now, these guys are on this boat. They're on the sea halfway across. So the Sea of Galilee is eight miles wide. It's even a little bit more north to south. They were going kind of at a kitty corner. They're, they've got, they're about halfway. They've got about four, three to four more miles to go. They're stuck on the, the, this lake, the sea, the sea, and it's dark. There's a void in the boat. The wind is rising up. 
The sea is rising up. They're shaking around. Why is it sea and not lake? So in Jewish literature, especially in the prophets in the Old Testament and in the book of Revelation, the sea often represents fear and insecurity and instability. The sea is topsy-turvy, okay? What you want is to have your feet on solid ground. Okay, And so here these guys are in the boat, the, that it's dark and there's a void, right? So here uh, we're trying, when, okay, see I get excited and I get ahead of myself, so I, I need to back up. Jesus is the only one that can fill that spot, right? No, anything, anybody could, but who should? Only Jesus. Now, is this story, these guys in the dark on the sea it, with wind and the waves? Is if this is not a metaphor for life without Jesus, I don't know what is. With me? I mean, I don't know how people do it without Jesus, because we all run up against stuff. We all get end up in the dark on the sea, in the storm, you know. And how people do that without Jesus, I have no idea. Because it's rough. And there's a void. It's a God void, and only God can fill it. But is it true that we try to fill? Is this, we live in a culture with, uh, like, a, it's an anything but Jesus culture. Anything but Jesus. And so, how do we deal with our fear? How do we deal with loneliness? How do we deal with uh, insecurity? How do we deal with depression? How do we deal with addiction? Right? We, we have these voids, and what do we do, right? People, how do people deal with fear? We deal with fear because, with uh, drugs and alcohol, right? I want to I want to fill the void. I want to escape it. I want to escape the feelings. Right? Entertainment, entertainment. We live in a I need to be entertained twenty four seven culture. We can't even sometimes appreciate really good things. We were at a play, the, the school like went to this play at the Hale Treasure Island. It was this amazing play. It was great. Two, it was all students there. So most of the audience was students. Like two thirds of the students are staring at their phones going, I just wanted to go, stop it. This is really good. You know, how much light? Because we got to be entertained all the time. What about loneliness? People fill loneliness with pornography or sexual immorality. We, we stress eat. We, we, we become workaholics, right? We fill the void with all the stuff except anything but Jesus. But who fills? Who's the only one who can fill that void? It's Jesus. And when he fills that void, when he fills that void, he says, I give you. You'll, life, I give you joy. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. He's the only one that can do that. We have to figure that out. At some point, we find ourselves this way like the disciples did. And here they are on this boat. Jesus walks on the water out to the boat. It's, I find it interesting. Jesus says, you come to, he says, come to me and you'll never hunger. But he comes to us, doesn't he? He gets so close that we can, what we really need to do is turn to him and say, will you willingly, we're, we're, we willingly bring you into the boat. That's what the scripture here says. It says uh, they, that they, here, verse 20. He said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat and immediately, now most people miss this miracle because we just jam through things too fast. They willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Do you get that? Four miles. Bam. Why? Because they weren't in the sea anymore. See, Jesus filled the void and they were on solid ground. You with me? The disciples learned this that day. They learned this. If we willingly take him in, he puts us on solid ground. Everything is solid with Jesus. Jesus comes to the boat, and I'm always like blown away by what he says to them because what he says, we translate it, it is I, but in Greek, it's ego me, it's I am. 
right? So here they are, and if you're a Jew, you're thinking, okay, wait a second. This is Genesis 1-1 all over again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth was void and without form, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters, and God said, let there be light. And in Hebrew, there's, a, there's an implicit chaos that's going on. Wind and sea rising and broiling, right? And God comes and he enters the void and he speaks, let there be light. And he starts to fill the void. Let, there, let the land separate from the sea. Let's have insects. Let's have animals. Let's have bushes and trees and grass. Let's fill it and let's have order. And God, that's what God does. He fills the void. He fills it so completely. He brings order and stability to all things. They willingly received him into the boat. Immediately they reached solid ground. He said, I am. Who's, who's I am? Yahweh. Yahweh. I am in Hebrew. Yahweh. I am that I am. Jesus is telling them, I'm God. And they willingly received him into the boat. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. If you believe in me, okay, what's believing? Believing is willingly taking him in, right? It's, it's an action word. It, we, we think of believing as an intellectual process, but it's not. Believing is an action word, all right? In Hebrew, it's pistuo. It means to faithfully exhibit it. So when you believe something, you prove that you believe it. The Hebrew word we've talked about before is aman. The Hebrew equivalent to this word is asa. So uh, the Hebrew equivalent, asa, we, we saw that a couple of times in the scripture from Deuteronomy. If you observe, what does observe mean? It's not just to look at, but to meticulously do, right? Asa means to meticulously do it. You do it. Aman, trust means that you think about it and then you say, okay, I, I, I trust you, and then you do it. Like, I always make the joke, it's not really a joke, but I look at a chair and I have to say, do I trust you? How do I show that I trust you? I'm going to sit on you, right? Because I, you know, I have to kind of ask myself that every time I sit in a chair, right? We have to trust. We do it. It's always a doing, okay? So, Believing is what Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 6. I reiterate this scripture all the time. It's very important to us as disciples, right? Jesus in Luke chapter 6, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? If you come to me and you hear what I say and you do it, you're like a man who builds his house on the rock, and the winds come, and the flood comes, and the, but the house stands firm, right? If you hear what I say, do it. All right, that's a saw. That's a saw in a picture, right? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, God tells Israel through Moses, he, he's, he says, I'm giving you all of this to do because I love you. I want you to have long life. I want it to be well for you. I want you to stay in this land of milk and honey. What does milk and honey mean? So milk, if you, where do you get milk from? Animals, right? So it's not, uh, it's not flowing with, it's got so many animals that it's flowing with milk. What's, what makes honey? Bees, what do bees do? Pollination, right? So you have... <laughs> You, the bees are making the, the fruit and the vegetables and the trees and the nuts and all those. So you've got so much exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we can ask or even imagine. So God says, that's what I want for you. So therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to asa. And the, the, go to the next screen. This is important, right? Because it, it's not italicized here, but in your Bibles, the word it is italicized, which means they stuck it in there. It's not in Scripture. It sounds like it, it's supposed to be. But it's, I, I, hero Israel, observe, asa. Well, implicitly, what's the asa? You asa it. What's the it? It's the covenant. It's the relationship. It's the parameters and rules of the relationship. That it may be 
well with you. What does God want for us? He doesn't, I just can't get this through to you enough. God is not out to slap you or zing you or ding you every time you eat an extra cookie. He loves you. He wants you. He wants, to, he wants it to be well with you. He wants you to have abundant life and complete joy. That is what God wants. He just says, Asa, willingly take me in. Call me Lord, Lord, and do what I tell you to do. That's, how we, that's what, how we have abundant life. Jesus promises that he is the bread of life. When we willingly take him in, he fills our emptiness. He puts us on solid ground. Now, how do we end, how do we end up keeping him out? If you listened to, to John chapter 6, there were a whole bunch of people there. They were not only his followers, many of them were his disciples. Not the 12, but there were other disciples. And they were chasing around after him. And at one point, they leave him completely. But what was it that kept them from willingly receiving Jesus? In the scripture, it said that they grumbled, they argued, they complained. Is, this is not just the history of the Jews, all right? You can go back and say, oh, that's the Jewish people. They're always doing that. Grumbling, arguing, and complaining. Look at Exodus. These stiff-necked people, they grumble so much. I'm sorry, but that's all of us. Okay? And if you want to keep people out of your lives, by all means, be a grumbler a, a, and an arguer and a complainer. Because everybody loves to hang out with them, right? Okay, so we put God, we, we put him at a distance when we hear what he says and we argue and complain. John 6, 41, the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. They said, what you're saying is too hard for us. What you're saying is too hard for us. And when we keep Jesus out, we tend to take things in that don't satisfy. For example, have you ever been super, super, super thirsty? You needed to drink water, but it was gonna be a little bit of work to get the water, so like in, you're in the office, right? And you know you need a, a glass of water, but what's really close is the coffee pot. So instead you drink coffee. Does that satisfy your thirst? It makes it worse, right? So see, this is what happens. When we keep God at a distance, the void stays the void. We get hungry, we get thirsty. What we need is him, but we take in what is expedient. When really what we, he's so close, all we need to do is turn and say, well, there he is saying, it is I. Willingly take him in. We need to do that. Because what will happen if we're not careful is, this always kind of freaks me out. It's John 6, 6, 6. <laughs> but the, one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible, John 6, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. That's shocking to me. And so sad. They heard, but they only wanted to be fed with bread. And then Jesus said to the twelve, to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But see, these guys had been in the boat, hadn't they? And they had him come to them and say, I am. Do not be afraid. And they willingly took him in, and they were instantly on solid ground. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Were they perfect? No. Did they take him in? Yes. And they kept taking him in. And they kept taking him in. And he just, he changed their lives and our lives forever, right? We just keep taking him in. There's one other thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't let your physical or spiritual hunger or thirst rule you. Take him in and be filled. He's your all in all. There's only one other warning that I kind of want to set out there. Um, as we get into these covenant promises with these I am statements. And this warning is something that is really, uh, 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 it's, it's precarious, right? And you see it happen with Judas. 
Did, and Judas knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But there's something that we know that Judas loved. He had a love for money. He had a love for money. And, and he convinced himself that the money could be used for good. You know, it, it, oh, I'm going to do it for something good. I'm going to take the money and use it for something good. But it was still a love for money, not a love for Jesus at some point. Where this really shows up for me, I, I love the Old Testament so much, and in the Judges, there's this guy Gideon. And Gideon, God comes to Gideon and God says to Gideon, Gideon, I'm going to make you my hero. And Gideon says, but I'm a coward. God says, no, I'm going to make you my hero. Gideon says, if you're going to make me your hero, I need confirmation. And so God keeps giving uh, Gideon confirmation that he wants him to be his hero. God gives Gideon confirmation so much that, that every time Gideon asks for it, God gives him confirmation. Eventually, God just starts giving the, the confirmation without him asking for it. And so Gideon obeys God in these really outlandish ways and saves the kingdom of Israel from its enemies. He, he's, he's a su successful, victorious hero. And the people, we, this is what we read earlier, the people looked at him and said, we want you to rule us. But Gideon said, no, 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 no. I won't rule you. My son won't rule you. Only God should rule you. But there's just, this is one little thing that I, that I would like. I just have one request. And, and I'll have to say this, like, this is, this is me, right? This is, I'm probably projecting myself into this a little bit, but here I've, he's, he's worked so hard. He's, I've been through all these battles. I've, I've done everything for the Lord. We've been victorious. Now we're safe. I'm exhausted. But you know, I just want this one little thing. Just the golden, can I just have the golden earrings? The, the, just the little golden earrings. I just, I'll do something super spiritual with it, I promise. Just give me this one little thing. It's just one little thing. And then what happens, right? Then Gideon made, took all that gold and he made it into an ephod. An ephod is a priestly garment. It's kind of like a girdle. He made it into a, an ephod and set it up in his city, Ophrah, and all Israel played the harlot with it there. In other words, they worshipped it. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. See, when we're exhausted, when, when we've worked so hard, when we think, you know, as soon as you start to think, I deserve it, you know, I, I, I just need this one. I've done everything for everybody else. I just need this, this one little thing for me. That's when it all falls apart. You know, from the time I was little, I was, I was four years old. I used to have this pastor that I adored. He was an associate pastor at the church, and I loved him. His name was, I called him Reverend Don because I couldn't say Reverend at four. And I had my little Reverend Don tie, and I pretended I would, pre I would preach to my stuffed animals like I was like I was like Reverend Don. Reverend Don ran off with the church secretary, and that that hurt me, crushed me. As I understood that that was wrong. In our lifetime, in my lifetime, fifty-two years old, how many great heroes and defenders of the faith, Bible teachers, preachers, evangelists, have fallen because of that one little thing? I just need that. Oh, just it's just for, I just need one thing for me. Just one thing for me. And Satan likes to dangle it out there, right? Oh, you deserve it. It's just one bite. He's been saying that from the garden, right? Just one bite. You can, you, you, you know, you'll be a better pastor if you just give in to this, this one thing, right? This is exactly the, the point where we need to get on our knees and say, Jesus bread of life come into the boat there's a void here an emptiness and it can only be filled by you i need you to fill the void when i'm weak you're strong when i'm weak you're strong so take my weakness 
Take my hunger. Fill me with you. Willingly take him into your hearts and minds. He'll fill you up. He'll put you on solid ground. He wants to be your bread of life. If you asa, observe, if you aman, if you trust, if you pastuo, if you faithfully do, he promises to, to, that you will never hunger and you will never thirst. No matter what winds rise up, no matter what storms blow, no matter what darkness covers, he promises. And he keeps his promises because he cannot lie. We just willingly take him in. Willingly take him in. He promises that he's the bread of life for you. Amen? All right. God, <laughs> you are beyond good. You are exceedingly, abundantly, above all. You are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or even imagine. That's what you want for us. Abundant joy, complete life, fullness, be our all in all. Come into the void, Lord God. Come into the, the void, Jesus, Lord Jesus. Fill us with you. Touch us and, and, and send us out in Jesus' name to, to give the bread of life to the world that hungers for you. We love you, Lord. Amen.